Hello, I'm Jim Thane. This spring, I'm the writer in residence at the Apache Junction Public Library. I also write a series of mystery novels set here in the valley featuring a Phoenix homicide detective named Sean Richardson. And in this podcast, I'd like to talk about the importance of a great opening to the book or article you might be writing. Easily the most important part of the book or article you might be writing is the first sentence leading into the first paragraph and the handful of paragraphs that follow immediately after the first. This is true even if you're writing nonfiction, but it's especially important if you're writing a novel, and the reason is probably obvious. The opening of your book or article is the first thing that an agent, a publisher, or a reader is going to see and you want to ensure that it's also not going to be the last thing that they see. Imagine, for example, that you're in your local bookstore thinking about buying a book. Or perhaps you're at your local library, looking through the selections, trying to find something that looks appealing enough to check out and take home. You see a book that has a cover that attracts your attention. And, of course, a good cover is also critically important in attracting the attention of a reader. You then look at the tease for the book on the cover flap or on the back of the book, and that sounds intriguing. So you open the book and take a look at the beginning of the first chapter. Does the opening grab your attention and draw you in so that you decide to buy the book or to check it out? Or does the opening leave you feeling kind of blah about the book and cause you to put it back on the shelf and move on to something else. The truth of the matter is that you might write a really great book, but if you don't grab the attention of an agent, a publisher, or a reader right off the bat, no one will ever know how good your book really is because no agent will ever agree to represent it, no one will ever agree to publish it, and no reader will ever buy it or check it out of the library. It's possible, of course, to write a really good beginning to a book and then follow it up with a story that's only mediocre. And I'm sure we've all had the experience of beginning a book that started out great and then left us disappointed in the end because the remainder of the book failed to live up to the promise of the opening. But while it's possible to sell a mediocre book that has a great beginning, it's a lot more difficult, if not impossible, to sell a great book that has only a mediocre beginning. So, what makes a great beginning to a book? Obviously, there are many ways in which an author might draw a potential reader into his or her book or article. But typically, the opening should either immediately draw the reader into the middle of some action scene so that the reader feels that he or she has to keep reading to see what happens, or it needs to immediately reveal something so compelling about a character that the reader has to keep going to find out more about the character. A mistake that beginning writers make all too often is that they take much too long to get into the action or to reveal something truly compelling about a character. One of the most successful novelists still working today is Lawrence Block. Over a career that has spanned close to 65 years, Block has written literally dozens of novels, most of them crime fiction, and his series featuring a New York private investigator named Matthew Scudder is my favorite of all Private Eye series. For many years, Block also wrote a regular column for Writer's Digest, in which he offered advice to beginning writers. Many of these columns were later collected into a couple of books, the better known of which is titled Telling Lies for Fun and Profit. When I was a fledgling novelist, I read this book very carefully, and the one piece of advice that I remember most from the book was Bloch's recommendation that you should always begin your novel with Chapter 2. What he was trying to suggest is that a lot of beginning novelists spend the first chapter of their books setting the scene. They talk about the weather. They go on at length about the setting. They introduce a few characters and describe their complete biographies. And they bore the daylights out of their potential readers. Then, with all of that out of the way, 
In chapter 2, something of interest finally happens. Bloch's advice, then, is that you should begin with the part that's interesting, that is, the part you saved for chapter 2, and then, once you have the reader's attention, you can begin to slowly fill in the details about the characters and the surroundings as the story progresses. I think that's excellent advice, and once I read it, I realized that I was guilty of making exactly that mistake with the first novel I was attempting to write, a book called No Place to Die. In the first chapter, I had carefully set the scene and introduced my main character, who, as I said, is a Phoenix homicide detective. I talked about his background, who he was, and where he came from, and after I'd taken a leisurely stroll through all of that kind of minutia, in chapter two, something finally happened. So, taking Bloch's advice, I literally threw away the first chapter and opened the book with what had been the second chapter, making only a couple of minor revisions to accommodate the fact that it was now the opening chapter. Let me just read the opening of the book to illustrate the point. The first chapter now begins like this. Dinner was almost ready when Beverly Thompson was snatched from her garage on a beautiful Wednesday evening early in February. At 43, Beverly was still an extremely attractive woman, with thick auburn hair that spilled down to her shoulders, framing an oval face highlighted by deep green eyes and a pair of medium full lips. She watched her diet carefully and worked out as regularly as she could, and thus remained fit and trim at five feet five inches tall and 121 pounds. On that Wednesday evening, Beverly was 27 months into her second marriage, her first to a fellow law student, had gradually run out of gas and finally sputtered to an end seven years earlier. Thankfully, it had produced no children. Through the first four years that followed the divorce, Beverly had dated gingerly, dedicating the bulk of her time and energy to her career as a medical malpractice attorney in a large firm in downtown Phoenix. But then she met David, a cardiologist who'd testified as an expert witness in a case that she'd won largely on the strength of his testimony. Following the trial, they had dated for four months and then lived together for another five before formally tying the knot. At 6.30 that evening, Beverly called David and told him that she was finally leaving the office after finishing a particularly grueling deposition. He promised to chill some Bombay sapphire gin and two martini glasses while he started dinner. Forty-five minutes later, eagerly anticipating the first sip of the promised martini, Beverly punched the button on the remote to open her garage door. She waited for a moment as the door rolled up. Then she pulled her Lexus SUV into the garage. She parked, as she always did, to the left of her husband's Mercedes, and then pressed the button on the remote to close the garage door behind her. She was just stepping out of the car when she saw the man, dressed all in black, slip under the garage door as it rolled back down. Instinctively, she jumped back into the Lexus. With her left hand, she hit the button to lock all the doors. With her right, she laid on the horn. In a heartbeat, the intruder was at the door of the SUV, pounding on Beverly's window with the butt of a pistol and yelling, Lay off the goddamn horn! Then he stepped back, pointed the gun at Thompson's head and shouted, Get out of the car, lady, now. I don't know if that's really a good beginning or not, but trust me, it's a huge improvement over what had originally been the first chapter of the book. With these thoughts in mind, then, let me read some examples of what I think are particularly good opening lines or paragraphs. Almost all of these examples come from the world of crime fiction, which is the genre that I know best, but the general rule still holds, no matter what genre you might be working in. I won't make many additional comments about these books, because I think that each of these selections speaks for itself. But in each case, the author draws you immediately into the story and makes it virtually impossible for you to continue not to read. 
In fairness, I suppose, I should amend that to say that in each case the author drew me into the story and I couldn't stop reading, but see if you don't feel the same way. This first selection is from a book called The Brass Verdict by Michael Connolly. This is the second novel in his series featuring Mickey Haller, the Lincoln lawyer, so named because his office is in the back seat of a Lincoln town car. Everybody lies. Cops lie, lawyers lie, witnesses lie, the victims lie. A trial is a contest of lies, and everybody in the courtroom knows this. The judge knows this, even the jury knows this. They come into the building knowing they will be lied to. They take their seats in the box and agreed to be lied to. The trick, if you were sitting at the defense table, is to be patient, to wait, not just for any lie, but for the one you can grab onto and forge like hot iron into a sharpened blade. You then use that blade to rip the case open and spill its guts out onto the floor. That's my job, to forge the blade, to sharpen it, to use it without mercy or conscience, to be the truth in a place where everybody lies. The next selection is from Gut Shot Straight, a great novel by Lou Burney, which features a professional crook named Sheikh Bouchon. Charles Samuel Bouchon, Sheikh for short, ever since his first fall for Grand Theft Auto when he was 19, took another look at his hole cards. He tended to fold with a bullet showing and his opponent betting big. But Shake was sitting on a pair of hearts, and he was pretty sure the beast across the table from him wouldn't recognize a flush if it jumped into his lap and kissed him on the mouth. The beast was Vader Wallace, a mean young black con from Block C, who was one long rope of muscle, braided around and around and around, until it was a wonder he could walk. He was doing a dozen years behind a first-degree manslaughter charge, aggravated, Extremely aggravated, according to the rumors. Shake, on the other hand, was just a rangy white guy up on another GTA, 42 years old and feeling every minute of it. But if he survived the last 15 months here at Mule Creek, he wasn't going to roll over just because some pumped up, puffed up con glared at him. He called Vader's bet. I'll pay to see that last card, he said and gave Vader a friendly smile. Next up, the opening paragraphs from The Eyes of Prey by John Sanford, the third novel featuring Minneapolis police detective Lucas Davenport. Carlo Drews was a stone killer. He sauntered down the old gritty sidewalk with its cracked uneven paving blocks under the bare branched oaks. He was acutely aware of his surroundings. Back around the corner, near his car, the odor of cigar smoke hung in the cold night air. A hundred feet further along, he touched a pool of fragrance, deodorant or cheap perfume. A motley crew song beat down from a second-story bedroom, plainly audible on the sidewalk. It had to be deafening inside. Two blocks ahead, to the right, a translucent cream-colored shade came down in a lighted window. He watched the window, but nothing else moved. A vagrant snowflake drifted past, then another. Drews could kill without feeling, but he wasn't stupid. He took care. He would not spend his life in prison. So he strolled, hands in his pocket, a man at his leisure, watching, feeling. The collar of his ski jacket rose to his ears on the sides, to his nose in the front. A watch cap rode low on his forehead. If he met anyone, a dog walker, a night jogger, they'd get nothing but eyes. From the mouth of the alley, he could see the target house and the garage behind it. Nobody in the alley, nothing moving. A few garbage cans like battered plastic toadstools waited to be taken inside. Four windows were lit up on the ground floor of the target house, two more up above. The garage was dark. Drews didn't look around. He was too good an actor. It wasn't likely that a neighbor was watching, but who would know? 
an old man, lonely, standing in his window, a linen shawl around his narrow shoulders. Drood could see him in his mind's eye and was wary. The people here had money, and Drew's was a stranger in the dark. An out-of-place furtiveness, like a bad line on the stage, would be noticed. The cops were only minutes away. With a casual step, rather than with a sudden move, Drews turned into the darker world of the alley and walked down to the garage. It was connected to the house by a glassed-in breezeway. The door at the end of the breezeway would not be locked. It led straight into the kitchen. If she's not in the kitchen, she'll be in the recreation room watching television, Becker had said. Becker had been aglow, his face pulsing with the heat of uncontrolled pleasure. He'd drawn the floor plan on a sheet of notebook paper and traced the hallways with the point of his pencil. The pencil had trembled on the paper, leaving a shaky worm trail in graphic. Christ, I wish I could be there to see it. The next selection is from A is for Alibi by Sue Grafton. This is the novel that introduced Santa Teresa P.I. Kinsey Milhone. My name is Kinsey Milhone. I'm a private investigator licensed by the state of California. I'm 32 years old, twice divorced, no kids. The day before yesterday, I killed someone, and the fact weighs heavily on my mind. I'm a nice person, and I have a lot of friends. My apartment is small, but I like living in a cramped space. I've lived in trailers most of my life, but lately they've been getting too elaborate for my taste. So I now live in one room, a bachelorette. I don't have pets. I don't have house plants. I spend a lot of time on the road, and I don't like leaving things behind. Aside from the hazards of my profession, my life has always been ordinary, uneventful, and good. Killing someone feels odd to me, and I haven't quite sorted it through. I've already given a statement to the police, which I initialed page by page and then signed. I filled out a similar report for the office files. The language in both documents is neutral, the terminology oblique, and neither says quite enough. From A is for Alibi, it would seem logical to turn to the opening of The Burglar Who Traded Ted Williams by Lawrence Block, whom I mentioned earlier. Let's see if Block actually follows his own advice. Not a bad-looking burglar, he said. I don't suppose you'd have a decent alibi. I didn't hear the italics. They're present not to increase indicate vocal stress, but to show that they were titles at least truncated titles. A is for alibi, and B is for burglar. Those were the books in question, and he had just laid a copy of the latter volume on the counter in front of me, which might have given me a clue. But it didn't, and I didn't hear the italics. What I heard was a stocky fellow with a gruff voice calling me a burglar, albeit not a bad-looking one, and asking if I had an alibi. And I have to tell you, it gave me a turn, because I am a burglar, although though that's something that I've tried to keep from getting around. I'm also a bookseller, in which capacity I was sitting on a stool behind the counter at Bernagat Books. In fact, I just about managed to forsake burglary entirely in favor of bookselling, having gone a whole year without letting myself into a stranger's abode. Lately, though, I'd been feeling on the verge of what those earnest folk in 12-step programs would very likely call a slip. Less forgiving souls would call it a premeditated felony. Next up, the opening paragraphs of Killing Floor by Lee Child. This was the book in which Jack Reacher first appeared. I was arrested in Anno's diner at 12 o'clock. I was eating eggs and drinking coffee, a late breakfast, not lunch. I was wet and tired after a long walk in heavy rain, all the way from the highway to the edge of town. The diner was small but clean and bright, brand new, built to resemble a converted railroad car, narrow with a long lunch counter on one side and a kitchen bumped out back. 
booths lining the opposite wall, a doorway where the counter where center booth would be. I was in a booth at a window reading somebody's abandoned newspaper about the campaign for president who I didn't vote for last time and wasn't going to vote for this time. Outside, the rain had stopped, but the glass was still pebbled with bright drops. I saw the police cruisers pull into the gravel lot. They were moving fast and crunched to a stop, light bars flashing and popping. Red and blue light in the raindrops on my window. Doors burst open, policemen jumped out, two from each car, weapons ready. Two revolvers, two shotguns. This was heavy stuff. One revolver and one shotgun ran to the back. One of each rushed the door. I just sat and watched them. I knew who was in the diner. A cook in the back, two waitresses, two old men, and one me. This operation was for me. I'd been in town less than half an hour. The other five had been there all here, probably been here all their lives. Any problem with any of them, and an embarrassed sergeant would have shuffled in. He would be apologetic. He would mumble to them. He would ask them to come along down to the station house. So the heavy weapons in the rush weren't for any of them. They were for me. I crammed egg into my mouth and trapped a five under the plate, folded the abandoned newspaper into a square, and shoved it into my coat pocket, kept my hands above the table, and drained my cup. The next selection is the opening of Carl Hyacin's novel, Lucky You. On the afternoon of November 25th, a woman named Jolene Lux drove to the grab-and-go mini-mart in Grange, Florida, and purchased spearmint certs, unwaxed dental floss, and one ticket for the state lotto. Uh, Jolene played the same numbers she'd played every Saturday for five years, 17, 19, 22, 24, 27, 30. The significance of her lotto numbers was this. Each represented an age at which she had gendered some, a burdensome man. At 17, it was Rick, the Pontiac mechanic. At 19, it was Rick's brother, Robert. At 22, it was a stockbroker named Calavito, twice Joe Lane's age, who delivered on none of his promises. At 24, it was a policeman, another Robert, who got in trouble for fixing traffic tickets in exchange for sex. At 27, it was Neil, the chiropractor, a well-meaning but unbearable codependent. And at 30, Jolaine dumped Lawrence, a lawyer, her one and only husband. Lawrence had been notified of his disbarment exactly one week after he and Jolaine were married. But she stuck with him for almost a year. Jolaine was fond of Lawrence and wanted to believe his earnest denials regarding the multiple fraud convictions that precipitated his trouble with the Florida bar. While appealing his case, Lawrence took a job as a toll taker on the B, uh, B Line Expressway, a plucky career realignment that nearly won Jaylene's heart. Then one night, he was caught making off with a 30 pound sack of loose change, mostly quarters and dimes. Before he could post bail, Jaylene packed up most of his belongings, including his expensive Hermes neckties, and gave them to the Salvation Army. Then she filed for divorce. Five years later, she was still single and unattached when, to her vast amusement, she won the Florida Lotto. She happened to be sitting in a place with uh, turkey leftovers in front of the television at 11 p.m. when the winning numbers were announced. Joe Lane Lux didn't faint, shriek, or dance wildly around the house. She smiled, though, thinking of the six discarded men from her past, thinking how, in spite of themselves, they had finally amounted to something. $28 million, to be precise. Finally, let me turn to a nonfiction book, just to illustrate the fact that a good opening is just as important in nonfiction as it is in fiction. This is the opening of The Passage of Power, the fourth volume in Robert Caro's magisterial biography of Lyndon B. Johnson. Air Force One, the president's plane, is divided behind the crew's cockpit into three compartments. The first of them, just behind the cockpit, women sat weeping and secret service agents were trying to hold back tears. 
You've heard of strong men crying. Well, we had it there that day, recalls a reporter. As the plane lifted off the ground, not in a climb so steep to a man standing aground, it seemed almost vertical. Leveled off for a few minutes, and then warned that there were tornadoes between him and Washington. The pilot put the plane into another clown to get above them. In the rear compartment, the widow, her suit stained with blood, was sitting to, next to the coffin of the dead president, and in the center compartment was the new president. Any reader might go to his or her bookshelf and pick out several books with opening lines and paragraphs that are excellent, but each of these, I think, is very good and serves to illustrate the point that an excellent opening is the key to writing a book that will attract an agent, find a publisher, and be bought by lots of readers and libraries. So, if you're in the process of writing a book, particularly if you're writing what you hope will be your debut novel, go back and look long and hard at the opening of the book. Will it be strong enough to immediately capture the attention of an agent a publisher, and ultimately thousands of readers? If not, keep playing with it and polishing it until you're sure it's will. And good luck with your efforts.